talk is going to be. Um, but hi, everybody. Uh, we're very excited for this talk. Um, just to give some information on, on Chin Wan. So he is a researcher at Uniswap Labs. Um, a lot of his research interests include empirical economics, economic design, and security of protocols, and many other topics related to the DeFi space. Today, Chin will be covering his talk called Hyperfragmented Liquidity, Adversarial Mempool, and of course, the biggest question of them all, what do? So without further ado, uh, Chin, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Okay, thanks. And thanks to uh, Spiritbit for having me here today. Um, this talk, as you can see, is, uh, is actually recycled from, from ECC. So if you, if you have seen that one, it's going to be almost the same. Uh, and uh, the, the, the issue here is um, uh, within this year, like Uniswap Labs sort of launched two new protocols. One is called Uniswap V4 and the other is called Uniswap X. And they're somewhat related, uh, and they they both have uh, the same kind of ethos to them, uh, which I'm going to go into more details. Um, but yeah, why don't we start by kind of motivating the the problem we're trying to solve here? So the first problem uh, that we have is uh, it's often impossible to find. Uh, quote unquote, the, the best liquidity, right? All liquidity in all venues. Um, it's hard itself to find Uniswap pools. Uh, I think there's like hundreds of thousands of them. And then there's other DeFi protocols. And then there's like centralized exchanges. Uh, it's just an impossible task to find all of them. Um, and as I said, like the number of pools uh, that grow over time is just really this exponential shape if you look at uh, history here. So what I'm showing here is um, number of pools by protocol version of just Uniswap, right? So this is not including uh, SushiSwap or Balancer or Curve or anyone, uh, just Uniswap. There is like 200,000 pools um, by, the, uh, by the start of 2023. Um, and, you know, someone who is, I think, uh, a data scientist at a um, uh, on-chain data provider company told me that there's 70,000 forks of Uniswap, right? So it's maybe not a multiplicative number, but, you know, at least you would expect one fork to have one pool. So uh, that just illustrates the, the difficulty, complexity of kind of finding all of them. And then you have to work on routing through them, which is even harder, right? Um, so this really um, kind of uh, backs the question of uh, <laughs> what can you do when, uh, when on one hand it's impossible to, to find all of them, as I said, but on the other hand, uh, you always have this constant fear that uh, if you're providing uh, like an interface to swappers and you know that you don't have access to, to all the liquidity out there in the world, uh, that's going to make you feel guilty almost, right? Because you know that you're not finding, quote unquote, the best execution. Uh, and the, the, the new exciting, but also <laughs> sort of a headache for backend developers is um, uh, Uniswap v4 is going to come out, I think, uh, maybe end of year-ish after Cancun. Uh, and the new feature specifically enabled by Uniswap v4 is uh, number one, each pool uh, is no longer a contract, right? In the in the past, Uniswap has employed this uh, factory and contract um, architecture, where each new pool is uh, a contract by itself and is generated by this factory contract. Um, so, in the past, if you want to deploy a Uniswap v3 pool, it costs you five hundred dollars. Um, but in Uniswap v4, because there's no new contracts to deploy all the pools are sitting within the big Uniswap v4 contract called the Singleton. Uh, it's about 99% cheaper. Um, oh, 
sorry, I think I just mm, lost my slides. Okay, and you know, just a reminder that uh, when when the price is low, the demand is high, right? If you look at uh, these charts, the most of the pools are the green part, which is V two, and that's because you know V two pools are much much cheaper uh, compared to V three. So, uh, so you would expect a lot of V4 pools, uh, probably on the same scale as, as V2. Uh, and furthermore, another feature of V4 is each pool uh, will have this thing called hook inside it. So hook is basically, uh, you know, almost like an API call to an arbitrary contract that does whatever the contract wants outside the pool. Right? And after the contract executes, it calls back into the, the pool and, and finishes the original pool logic. So now you, you can't really think of Uniswap pools as these um, homogenous uh, thing that, you know, like I think for, for integrators, like uh, for example, DAX aggregator, uh, all they had to do previously was just to treat all the pools as like the same sort of like mathematical object. Uh, and and they just need to like plug in the, the existing parameters of the pool and they can kind of use some known algorithm to find the best route. Whereas in Uniswap v4, each pool is completely different, right? The, the arbitrary logic thing uh, just makes your uh, sort of known uh, algorithm not working anymore. Uh, so yeah, what <laughs> what do we do about it? Right? I, I think that's uh, that's going to be a really tough question. Uh, the second motivating problem we have is um, swappers are not the only uh, group of people in the mempool, right? Um, when they when they send a transaction, it's not it's not really a transaction itself. It's it's really like an object in the mempool. It's called a pending transaction, and then there's like MEV searchers. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with it. Um, but uh, here's my claim. Uh, the claim is you can't have these two things at the same time. You can't have, number one, a fully permissionless system, uh, and number two, some money left on the table that's not being taken by, you know, by one of these guys. Um, so, um, so we definitely want you know, Ethereum or any blockchain to be as permissionless as possible. Uh, and that just means, you know, uh, we have to be very careful about leaving money on the table because they, they will be gone after you, after you leave them. Uh, so this is a, this is one example of, uh, of people leaving money on the table and being taken by other people, right? Um, so this is daily profit um, by, well, basically on the Ethereum blockchain uh, by US dollar value, right? So on a daily basis, we're seeing about, you know, tens of thousands of dollars uh, lost to sort of sandwich attackers. And why do I say this is money left on the table? It's because these swaps are are sandwichable in the first place because their slippage tolerance was set too wide, right, or too loose. So um, the the sandwich attacker is is able to front run your transaction, push your execution to the worst that you yourself has sort of allowed in your transaction, and then they can back run it for a profit. And the leaving money on the table part is when you set your slippage tolerance, you have to be really careful not to kind of allow um, too much discrepancy between what you expect and what you know you you actually allow to happen. Um, and here's another fact, right? Um, we're seeing that you know tens of thousands of dollars are being left on the table by sort of innocent uh, swappers. But on the other hand, the searchers here, the MEV searchers are getting sophisticated day by day, right? So here, here's one example of, of one arbitrage uh, conducted by you know, a single bot. 
and just look at like don't look at the the actual numbers just look at the the complexity of the transaction uh it's it's pretty amazing that they're able to do this in a fully automated fashion. Right? They just run themselves. Um, and another thing that I want to mention, which also kind of motivates the design is, you know, MEV uh, as, an, as a phenomenon is sort of bad for consensus stability. Um, and there's a paper by uh, Mariam, Pranav, and Tim at ACCZ and yeah, this sort of proved that with the presence of, of MEV, it's very hard to um, uh, it's very hard to design sort of an optimal transaction fee mechanism. Okay, so now we have two motivating problems, right? Just to recap, the first one is uh, it's very very hard to find. Uh, all the liquidity, and then after you find all the liquidity, you have to um, search for the best route among all these liquidity. And uh, the second fact is, you know, people are leaving money on the table, and there's very sophisticated players in the market that's sort of adversarial by nature, and they they are very good at taking advantage of these uh, money left on the table. So let's visit some some of the conventional wisdom thing, right? Uh, in terms of solving these problems, uh, the solution one is you, you just have this very very hardworking aggregator, who um, you know who's who's constantly looking out for new sources of liquidity and then uh, in, integrate them in into their search algorithm and they they, um, they kind of relentlessly search through all possible routes and they somehow give you the service almost for free, right? You, you'd expect them to eventually want to charge something, but let's say for now, they, they work very hard and they, they give the solution to you as an end, end user uh, almost without charging you too much money. Um, and this, the second problem is sort of, you know, very related to the first one is like, you can really do this yourself if you want. You can buy up a beefy machine and you can sort of uh, do this like complex math to to find the optimal route, right? If you get to all the liquidity, of course. Um, and there's like OFA approach, which is uh, somewhat related to what I'm going to be discussing today, but um, it is a more of a market-oriented approach. Um, but the, the exact implementation is still uh, a very hotly debated topic. And I don't think there is a, there's sort of a canonical design yet, right? There's a few implementations in production. I think, uh, for example, Flashbots has their uh, MavShare. Um, there's another thing called MavBlocker. CowSwap has a um, batch auction design. And, you know, Uniswap obviously has Uniswap X. Uh, but Jury is still out on exact benefits and, how much we can expect from these. Uh, and, and just to be clear, right, uh, both v4, like designing hooks that plug into Uniswap pools that allows pool to have custom functions, as well as Uniswap X, uh, which comes down to you know solving for the best route, all these are commercial opportunities and, and we have always wanted people to build on top of Uniswap. So um, I think these are commercial opportunities in case this has not been clear. Uh, oh, no. Uh, OK. I have to. <laughs> OK. Uh, but interestingly, I want to point out that you know problem one and problem two are related, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so, so why are they related? Well, problem one says it's very hard to find all liquidity and route through all liquidity optimally, and problem two are you know there's these very sophisticated and adversarial group of people who are, uh, in fact, very good at solving problem one, right? They just they sort of use it against the users by default. Uh, and so 
the one solution to to solve this issue is sort of use some you know, game theory design and and try to align the interest of users uh, with these people, right? And and incentivize them to use their skills uh, to give benefits to the user. But how do you do it? Uh, well, one way is to to let them compete for opportunity to serve the user, right? And and to you reward the winner of the competition uh, with a little bit of money on the table, just enough to incentivize them, but not uh, as much as how much the users are losing to them right now. So, oh my God, one sec. Okay, so. This is our slides at ECC where we introduced the protocol Uniswap X. Uh, it's a phone. Uh, it's not. It's, a, it's an auction-based routing protocol. And uh, what I mean by that is, um, yeah, so how it works is um, the swapper in, in the Uniswap X system uh, in the past, when, they, when in Uniswap X, they sort of sign a transaction, right? They sign an uh, executable uh, thing that's then got executed on chain. In Uniswap X, you, you no longer do that, right? You sign this off-chain Dutch order, which is just your signature, but not an executable transaction. Uh, and then your price, like you would send this and say, hey, uh, anyone take this and try to fill it. But if if none of you can, don't worry, like just wait. And then after a while, uh, the price of your uh, order will start to decay automatically. Uh, and decay means that it's it become increasingly profitable for someone else to take the other side and it becomes increasingly worse for you as a swapper. Uh, and why did it become worse? Because you know, at a better price, no one had interest in filling them. Um, so yeah, the price will decay until transactions filled or timed out. Um, and now you, you have the right incentive for MEV searchers, market makers, and, and all the professional people to compete and, and fill first, right? So the price will decay, uh, and you would expect in the competitive market that when any one of these people who is able to take the other side for a profit greater than zero, uh, they should start to have an incentive to fill you. They might not fill immediately if they believe that they're so much better than everyone else and they believe that they can wait for the price to decay further so that they can make more money on your order. But if they're no, not so confident uh, and they think that there is some really competitive players out there, if they wait, uh, they might lose the order completely, right? Because anyone can fill the order. So uh, all it takes is just at least two competitive fillers out there for this market to be almost completely in the swapper's favor, right? So all you need is like a cent on the table and then you know all these people will start working for you. Um, Uh, but the question is, where do you start your order, right? Where do you start the Darsh auction and where do you want the price to decay to? How long does the decay take place? Um, I, I think these things are hard questions related to you know, the market uh, and they can be optionally parameterized by an RFQ, although that's not required. Anyone can just like construct an order and sign it and send to everyone they know. Like you can literally sign this and post on Twitter. And if the enough fillers are watching your Twitter feed, they can they can actually fill your order, right? So um, so you don't you don't have to rely on, for example, Uniswap Labs to to do this for you. If you believe you have distribution, you can you can do it yourself. Yeah, so this is a this is a sort of a illustrative diagram of how things work. So um, on the left, you have a sort of a vanilla Dutch order whose price just decays all the time. 
And on the right, you have an optional RFQ version where you say, okay, I'm going to use an RFQ, but um, how do you, well, sorry, maybe I should have said, but RFQ refers to request for quote, which means you literally go out and ask a bunch of people, right? Uh, hey, where do you think you can fill my order? And the idea is um, you just start with the best one. So if 10 people come to you and the, the highest bid is uh, you know, 12, 20 for, for 0.5 ETH, let's say. Uh, then you say, okay, my order is going to start right here. And then if, because you have uh, provided me with the best quote, I now incentivize you to fill it by giving you a small uh, exclusivity period, right? So on the right side, the little flat thing at the top is that little like incentive for people to actually win the auction and indicate their best price. Um, and you know, if they don't fill, then the price starts to decay and then everyone can come in and try to fill the order. So, so the claim here is um, this protocol creates a, um, a competitive marketplace for, for trade execution. Um, it it complements Uniswap v4. Oh, sorry about the font, but it complements Uniswap v4 because v4 makes uh, Uniswap protocol itself really really hard to route through. Uh, and now we just kind of outsource the, the routing problem completely, right? Uh, and it aggregates on-chain off-chain liquidity. So so these people who are filling your orders, they don't have to route through on-chain. Like we literally don't care how they fill you. All they have to do is deliver the right amount of token to your wallet. That's that's all this protocol cares about, and so they can they can basically have a bunch of off chain liquidity, like their own EOA address, their own smart contract address. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the only thing that matters then we have an on chain contract to check for is, you know, they took your input and they actually delivered uh, the amount of output that they said they will deliver. Uh, it's also you no know, gas free or gasless, whatever you want to call it. it. It doesn't mean there's no gas cost. It just means that because they can, they can, uh, the fillers can abstract away the gas component. Uh, uh, you don't have to own gas anymore, right? You don't have to own ETH in your in your wallet. If you have USDC and you say, "Hey, I want to swap for Pepe," uh, just you know, take the uh, the gas cost off the output, right? So you just get a little less Pepe, um, but you don't have to own ETH. Um, and that's really nice because uh, the there's fluctuation in exchange rates between any two tokens and there's fluctuation in Ethereum gas price. Uh, but now the two fluctuations can be combined into one. And, you know, maybe one filler has the best exchange rate to offer but their gas cost is somehow higher than other people. And the other filler has maybe slightly worse exchange rate, but they're really gas efficient. So in the end, the one with, the, with more gas efficiency might win, right? Because they ended up delivering uh, more output to you, uh, regardless of how they did it. So I think this is, this is really good because I think eventually people care about the net execution. You know, if one if one guy can execute your trade for for hundred dollar, the other can execute it for ten. Now, obviously, you know, the, the ten one should have a ninety dollar advantage in the in the actual exchange rate. Okay, I did this again. Let me go back. Okay. So uh, there's also no cost for failed transactions because you didn't sign the transaction. You just signed this, uh, this order and this, the fillers are the ones responsible for submitting a transaction on chain. And if their submission failed, they bear the cost of failed transactions, not you. Uh, your order is still valid. Someone else can still take your order and fill it. Uh, it's the filler themselves who, who take the risk of execution. And lastly, you know, MEV internalization, right? Let's say your order is huge 
and it would otherwise create a big price impact and there's a big back running opportunity. Now, because these people, we expect them to have the ability to, to back around anyways, uh, they will actually bid up uh, for your order uh, up to the point of their back running profit, right? Exactly as we have discussed before, where you know, they don't have to bid up that much, but if they believe someone else is competitive and has the same back running capacity, uh, they will lose the order, right? The other people can bid up more and uh, eventually the, all the bidding up uh, becomes sort of internalized benefit to the swapper. Okay, this is as of you know, uh, ECC, so the opt-in beta has been live for a while now and uh, we're seeing really promising results. So you know, to the extent that you do any on-chain swaps, I encourage you to try it. Uh, one more thing, right? Um, you, can, you can very easily generalize this Uniswap X uh, protocol to, to cross-chain. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that um, uh, Dutch orders, they, um, they're sort of this abstract notion, right? They, they, uh, they don't belong to any chain. Um, and eventually all we have to do is just to check that uh, your, your destination wallet sort of received the output that you specified. So we can do this on across chains and um, specifically they enable you know, cross chain swaps and fast L2 exit. Um, and you don't care about bridge anymore, right? The, these fillers essentially uh, become your bridge uh, or become your token bridge. What you eventually need is, um, is a message passing bridge to verify that your wallet on another chain actually received the output token. And I'll, I'll give you some details uh, in a second. Um, but the benefit here is, you know, it will be a seamless UX for Swapper. Um, the, the fillers here manage uh, gas on two chains and they also manage any bridging latency, right? The, um, like you don't have to click any button in terms of like uh, sending to a bridge, bridging over, withdraw from a bridge, waiting for the bridge to, to verify and all that. All you have to do is you say swap and your token A on chain one becomes token B on chain two. Um, and there's native asset swaps, right? So why do we, why do we want that? Because uh, in this world, you almost don't need any bridged asset, right? Uh, there's, there's no reason for you to have bridged OP on Ethereum or bridged Ethereum on OP. You can just switch from ETH on Ethereum to OP on Optimism. And there's no reason for you to come constantly bear uh, the bridge risk or bridge hack risk. Um, yeah, covered that. Okay, so let me illustrate how this works, right? Um, so you started off signing an order, uh, again, to, to a filler. And once you sign the order, uh, they claim, right? They say, okay, I, this order is mine. I, I bid the highest and whatever. And oh, this, uh, this control is really in place, so I can't see my own slide. Oops. Uh, okay, I'm back. Um, okay, and uh, and then wh when they claim the order, um, the Uniswap X contract will fetch your input token into the contract itself, but not sending it to the filler yet, right? It needs to verify that the, the other side is completed. Um, okay, and the third step is the filler actually needs to fill on a different chain, right? So um, it will send its its token to, you know, uh, the Uniswap X contract on, well, this is all abstract away, but basically it will just send some token to your, to your, to your wallet. And then it needs to, okay, now you as a swapper has the output token now. Uh, we need to tell the Uniswap X contract on the origin chain to actually give your input to the filler. Right? Otherwise, they will be giving you token for free. 
So yeah, so then there needs to be a proof which can be sent over on any you know, user specified uh, message, passing, pa message passing bridge. And yeah, and once you know, this proof is verified, the input token will be sent to the filler. So yeah, I think use of V4, we can think of it as you know, an AMM platform for LPs and devs. Right? We're sort of outsourcing uh, AMM development and AMM improvement to the community. We're saying, hey, like USM Labs will never be able to experiment and build all the cool features out there for AMMs. Why don't we make uh, sort of a meta AMM platform so that everyone can build their own ideal AMM on top of Uniswap. And then Uniswap X is doing sort of the same thing. It's like, okay, now we have all these AMMs. We can't really, as you know, one single entity, find the best route through them. Why don't we just outsource and the routing problem also to everyone and then you know, may the best filler win, right? They, um, the best filler will get all the orders and they will... They will make the most money. So um, I think the use of V4 and use of X are very complementary, and um, and they they sort of have the same ethos that you know eventually we should let everyone uh, compete and the you know may the best player win, and eventually it's going to be you know best for swappers also. Okay. Um, So I think, yeah, this is just the, the first step here, right? Um, I think there's a, there's a lot more that we can do. Uh, for example, the filler network needs to be decentralized further. Um, uh, I think uh, in terms of scaling privacy, uh, there's a lot to be done. Like right now, swappers, the, the cost of swapping, especially for small swaps are... 90% gas fee, right? Um, and, and that's really, that really comes down to scaling the chain, et cetera. Um, and yeah, we're, we're very happy and open to collaborate with other projects in the space uh, towards the shared goals. Um, yeah, this is a joke. So you <laughs> says, what's my purpose? And you help people swap new coins. Oh my God. Uh, we definitely you know, uh, hope and really are excited for the future of, sort of having these permissionless market be the foundation for, for liquidity provision and value exchange for everything, right? But um, that is still quite a few miles away and we have you know, a lot of work to do. Uh, and eventually we want to compete with centralized exchanges and tra traditional finance markets. Um, and there's you know, all these markets and asset classes that we believe uh, could be traded on chain. Uh, we just need to, you know, work hard to get there. Um, okay, so thank you very much. That's that's all I have. Uh, here's my Twitter, my personal website. You know, if if you're looking to uh, collaborate, jam on, you know, Uniswap V4 hook ideas, you know, some X, you know, filler opportunities. Um, you know where to find me. And thanks everyone for coming. And you know. Thanks again to Sparebit for having me. Yeah, no, absolutely, Chen. Uh, if it's okay, we did have a few questions that were submitted. Uh, do you have a sec uh, if you're sure. okay with answering some of them? Uh, so sure. for everybody um, on the seminar, uh, you can submit questions at onlinequestions.org. Um, there is an event number that you'll need to use, 10595. It's on the screen. Uh, but we have three questions so far that were submitted. First question that we have, um, so somebody was asking, uh, can you swap to a new address with reference to gasless swapping? I'm sorry, could you could you say that again? I yes, yeah, so somebody asked if uh, they were asking, can you swap to a new address with reference to gasless swapping? Can you swap to a new address? Ah, you want your destination to be uh, different than your input. Uh, like where the input token is. Is that right? I'm assuming that's that that was their intention. Uh, the question. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I think it's 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 easily supportable by the smart contract, 
I don't think that's supported by our front end right now. So yeah, I think to answer your question, you know, like if you look at the cross chain version, it has to be a different uh, wallet, right? Almost. So, so that's definitely a supported functionality. Uh, I don't think you have that on the UX right now. Like you, when you swap, we, we don't have a field for you to enter the destination uh, wallet, but that is definitely supported on the smart contract level or, or could be supported on the smart contract level. Awesome. Uh, and two more questions. Uh, one question. Uh, so somebody asked, uh, were there any additional benefits to using a single ton structure besides uh, cost benefits? I think routing is much much easier. Uh, again, it it could be it could be categorized as a cost benefit analysis, um, but you know, like you don't have to uh, transfer between contracts anymore. Uh, all you have to do is sort of net everything out, right, and just do uh, one transfer in, one transfer out. Um, other than that. Um, yeah, I think I think mostly it, it comes down to like saving gas cost. Awesome. Uh, the last question we had was, uh, what are the biggest concerns and reference to, or constraints with with introducing hooks in V four? Um, I think yeah, like security wise, it's definitely a little bit scary. Uh, in the sense that you know, like you now allow arbitrary things to happen during execution, and that's just very, very hard to sort of reason about. Um, and practically speaking, and again, like I stress that here's commercial opportunities. Uh, it will be a big challenge for people using liquidity to sort of. Uh, uh, protect themselves, right? So they have to know uh, which which hook, which pool is safe to use. And just as you know, in the past, when you look at arbitrary tokens, you're like, okay, is this token safe? Is this a honeypot? Is this you know, a token that I can only buy, and not sell? Or there's like arbitrary dev mint function. Uh, I think in the future, uh, if you want to, if you want to like use you know so v4 pools you'll be like okay is this pool safe right is the hook safe <laughs> can i can i get rocked by by using any arbitrary hook um and you know like just as the, the there's companies doing these like token screening uh service there will be sort of hook safety service right i was, I was kind of posting on twitter a lot on on different iterations of the idea but yeah i think you know from a user's perspective and from a AMM developer perspective, being able to audit and have uh, sort of faith and confidence in uh, in different hooks is really important. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Awesome. Um, another question just came in. Um, somebody asked, uh, how does the source chain and destination chain communicate when submitting proofs? Right, so uh, it it can use any uh, message passing passing bridge. the The bridge uh, designation will be provided by the swapper, right? And if the swapper is you know someone who's not sophisticated, uh, then I imagine the wallet provider or the interface provider will specify it for them. So it comes down to like either if you're using Uniswap interface, it might be Uniswap. If you if you're using MetaMask in uh, if you know to the extent that MetaMask is not plugging and use Uniswap X, then they might uh, uh, specify it for you. So yeah, the, the short answer is it's user specified. And the long answer is you know it's user and whoever user delegate uh, specify what bridge it will be used. Great, fantastic. Um, I believe those are all the questions that we had. Um, but yeah, Jin just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to present. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, for everybody, this is recorded. It will be also posted on YouTube as well as Twitter once the live stream is ended. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody for attending and thank you, Chin, so much for your time. Thank you very much and very my pleasure to, to present here.